Mr. Gandhi needs no introduction. So let's uh, start straight away. Varun, you have been a politician since 2009. All right, that's many, many years. How do you find yourself in parliament? Actually, there's a bit of a strange anecdote about how I find myself in parliament. Um, I applied to Oxford University in uh, 98 to go there and when I went for the interview, I realized that the person who takes your interview at Oxford, he doesn't uh, have anything to do with the subject that you're interviewing for. He's just testing your basic in IQ. So there's something called a UCAS form that you apply for through and he said, uh, you said you like reading. What do you like reading? And I thought I must say something really impressive. So I said, I like reading literary criticism, but I had no idea what it meant. And he said, oh, that's interesting. Who's your favorite literary critic? And I thought about it and I said, Henry David Thoreau, because I just read On Walden Pond. And he looked at me very pensively and he said, you know, Henry David Thoreau wasn't a literary critic. And I said, and I looked at him right in the eye because I knew I had to knock it out of the park. And I said, Professor, his entire life was an act of literary criticism. <laughs> so he looked at me on that cold December morning and he said, Mr. Gandhi, either you'll be a great man one day, and he paused, or you'll be a spectacular bullshitter your whole life. And uh, the next year, when I got into LSE and I went to see a friend at Oxford, I bumped into the same professor at the Quad of Christchurch. So I said, Professor, now that I know it's the latter, where do I go from here? And he said, get a seat in the Indian Parliament. So here I am. <laughs> so does that mean you're bullshitting in Parliament a lot? Uh, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Actually, you floated a... A, a, a bill recently yes. on the Rojgar uh, for the yeah. youth thing. What are the salient points of that bill and how much do you think your government is going to be able to kind of you know, get it through? The first question is easier to answer than the second. You know, the thing is, uh, Mahesh Vyas of CMIE and I, a uh, couple of other economists, we sometimes share information, etc. And one of the things that I found was that there are 79 lakh vacancies for government jobs in India, center and state. And I just thought that this was, uh, you know, a very a huge thing. And uh, all governments, state governments, central governments, repeated central governments, always talk about creating new jobs. And I just thought, why don't you just fill the vacancies that are already there? Because something that all young people here should know is that 79% of all government jobs that have been created in the last five years have been contractual jobs. Those are not real jobs, they don't have pensions, they don't have any social security benefits, you can be sacked on one day's notice. It is not really a government job per se. Every village in all over India has an Asha Bahu, an Anganwadi, a Shiksha Mitra, etc., etc. The names may change. But the point is that they don't have any job security. So the bill that I've introduced is called Bharosa, Bharatiya Rozgar Samhita. And what it says is basically in a time-bound manner, you identify the vacancies, you have uh, exams and clearances for them, and then in 45 to 60 days, you give those people the jobs. So I put this across. Uh, I have uh, dealt with certain ministers on this. They've promised, if you notice, when I put in the bill is when the prime minister after 10 days said that they'll create 10 lakh new jobs. So the point is that, you know, what is your politics? Is your politics just to sit in the chair, whether it's in parliament or in a party or whatever, or is your politics of to be of use to the country. If your politics is to be of use to the nation, you've got to sometimes strike a raw nerve, be a little uncomfortable, because it's useful to millions and millions of people thereof. 
Yeah, as a member of parliament, I mean, what you've done is a very lofty and uh, sincere thing which perhaps needed. But as a, as a member of parliament, how much power do you have to kind of make sure that it's something a very, like this It's through? a very good question. The answer is technically you have very little power. That's the truthful answer. But let me give you an example. I'm the person that put in the Jan Lokpal bill into parliament. I, I was the only one that put it in. Uh, after that, you know what happened. And I want to say one small thing. The last time I came to this event, uh, about five years ago, four years ago, I requested something to this very audience that had a very big impact. And many of you may not remember because you weren't there. All the universities and think tanks and all I used to speak at, I used to say one thing. Why do parliamentarians have the right to arrogate to themselves a salary increase at will? So when I entered parliament, there were three salary increases over three years. And you know how you increase your salary? By raising your hand, everybody raises their hand. I wish you, you could do the same. And uh, so I said, this is unlawful and it's not fair. And so I kept hammering on at this. And when I last came to this uh, New Indian Express uh, think at you conclave, I said, People should write in to the Prime Minister, email the Finance Minister, talk about these issues. And one day I just got a call uh, from uh, the then Finance Minister and he said, uh, you know what, you have to stop pestering me with this stuff. And then they created a body which then froze increases that were arbitrary. They said, Com we have to look at performance, we have to look at inflation, we have to look at all these things. And for five years, they froze increases. So what I'm saying is, pressure politics is not about getting anything for yourself. When people feel that you speak for people other than yourself, your voice actually becomes more potent. Okay, see, uh, unfortunately, the rule of politics is that a minister it's not necessarily doesn't have the domain expertise to run his ministry. That's true. Right? Uh, for that, the bureaucrats are supposed to help. Who also, by the way, have exactly. no domain expertise. Exactly, I was coming expertise. to that. So how do you as a member of parliament who is supposed to kind of, or not supposed to, I mean who has to push for things to be done, according to the way you pass a bill or you have a kind of project you want to kind of push through, how do you communicate it to a minister or a bureaucrat? See, it depends on intent first of all. The day I came to parliament, I took out a list of how many parliamentarians have a net worth of over 25 crore rupees. And the list was quite a lot, to be honest. And I said, you know what, uh, people, people like all of us who are privileged, we don't need to draw a salary. So I've never taken a parliamentary salary in 14 years. We gave you one like. And, uh, you gave one lakh as, uh, to, to a fund, right? No. One. So what I do is that every uh, what I do is every month I write a letter because Parliament doesn't have a provision to negate your salary. So what I do is every month uh, I send the name of the family of a farmer in India who's committed suicide, and automatically the money goes to their family. That, that's very commendable. And I wrote uh, a letter regarding this to all the MPs who've got a net worth over 10 crore rupees. And I said, let's voluntarily give up our salaries. It eases the burden on the exchequer, it sends a good message. And uh, a few of them did, but let's see. You know, you won elections with amazing margins. Your cousin lost, tell me, I think he lost uh, his election by a rather interesting margin. Don't you find the contrast um, kind of telling? Hmm. You know, I will say this, which is that uh, there are many reasons for winning, there are reasons for losing. I'll be very candid. The first election, the second election, I think I won on my steam. The last election, almost everybody that had a BJP ticket won. <laughs> so. The truth is that winning elections doesn't make you a leader and losing elections doesn't diminish you. 
तो भारत जोड़ो नो बट आई विल से दिस दैट वॉट इन माई वॉट इन माई फ्रेम ऑफ माइंड मेक्स यूर लीडर इज दैट यू डोंट प्रिपेयर फॉर द नेक्स्ट इलेक्शन यू प्रिपेयर द कंट्री फॉर द नेक्स्ट जेनरेशन सो इट्स नॉट जस्ट एवरीथिंग इन इंडिया टूडे इज इलेक्शन सेंट्रिक I have to go back to my constituency because now there are municipal polls. Then there'll be zilla parishad polls. Then there'll be MP polls. Then there'll be MLA polls. It never ends, and uh, I just feel that maybe we just need to take a step back. And you know, John F. Kennedy said, "I spent 20 years trying to get the job. I didn't spend 20 minutes thinking about what I would do when I got the job." Okay. You know, so. Yeah, I mean, stretching out on this particular point, I mean, it's personal, of course. See, your father was would have been if he had lived probably the way he was going, be the architect of a new India. You know, he was into industrialization, into modernization, he was into swift action, etc., etc., etc. Unfortunately, his father, I mean, his brother, who became the prime minister, he was more of a not that kind of active. Let's kind of put his legacy was in that active. Now, you were, I, I, I mean, supposing. what sanjay gandhi had done he hadn't died and going by the legacy which he would have left you don't you think you are the rightful you know person as, as the legacy of the gandhi family you know i tell you what i feel always that my glass is half full i want to ca- can i take 2 minutes to tell two stories sure. while i was writing the last book a rural manifesto i came across two people and you know how in life we always feel like we're not as fortunate as we should be or we've got a raw deal everybody here feels that and uh, i met uh, two people one guy was called babar ali and babar comes from a small village called bhapta in murshidabad in bengal and uh, he every day went to school 10 kilometers away and every day he came back and he said everybody else is doing marginal labor all the young kids so he said every day what i learn in school i'm going to come back underneath a guava tree and teach all the kids in my school he was their age and soon it grew to 300 children and he would get broken terracotta tiles and make a blackboard steal a little bit of chalk and then it became a big thing cnn gave him award of a real hero of the year 100000 dollars built a school today 1500 people study in that school people took inspiration from him and went forward and then started making satellite schools saying if this poor person can do it we can do it today because of one boy who's just 32 years old now murshidabad has gone double in its literacy rate in the last 15 years so one person can make a difference and no amount of power is too little to make a difference The second uh, person I came across is even more amazing. I just take a minute. His name is Shrikant Bola. Shrikant Bola was born blind. When he was born his in uh, in uh, Andhra Pradesh, Sita Ramapuram, and his parents said, "We don't want to keep him." The grandparents said, "We'll keep him." When he was in class 10, he got 95 percent. The school said, "You can't study science because you're blind. You have to do arts." He took them to court. in 6 months he won a case it's a landmark judgment he did science he got 99% in his class 12 after that he applied to iit he gets into iit top 20 rank in the whole country iit says we can't take you why can't we take you because you're totally blind how will you be on the campus etc etc it's very difficult for us to keep an attendant with you he says no problem he applies to mit he gets a full scholarship to mit becomes their first international blind student goes to mit comes back he comes back he starts a company called bolent industries today it's a 350 crore company 80% of people who work for the company are blind or severely disabled working with areka nat etc etc so i just thought you know uh i've got so much more than my due and what i need to do is to strengthen the pathway for others to get their due if you spend one minute in your life 
thinking about the glass being half empty, you are wasting your time and you are wasting whatever opportunities you've been given. So if you were, let's say, if you were the education minister, what are the three things you would do? I would first get an education. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's difficult. Uh, sorry, I really don't mean to be catty. Uh, if I was the education minister, I would do four things. One is I would change the curriculum. Two is I would ramp up the amount of teachers we have. I would spend uh, money on skilling people rather than just on capital infrastructure. Uh, four percent of the Indian workforce is skilled as opposed to 94 percent in South Korea. I would uh, increase vocational education and I would uh, do what they do in South Korea, what they do in Germany, which is once you finish your education, you can take another three to five years to do vocational education as well as working at the same time in companies that participate in the initiatives to skill up. And that's the biggest thing we need to do in our country is to take the brain that Indians have, which is the finest brain in all the world, and to just harness that raw talent that we have as a country. Okay. Uh, see, when you entered politics, now getting back to personal, personal political hyphenated. Uh, you started politics, uh, made, became an MP in 2009? Yeah. Right. And you have been an MP uninterrupted until yeah. now. And uh, many times I noticed that your politics or your political statements don't often co coincide with your party's official statement. It does it get you into hot water? I mean, does it sure. get you into more than hot water? Uh, look, I feel that when you do the politics of conviction, you know, when Anna Hazare did his movement, I went and sat on the ground for a day to support them. At that time, people said, you're doing it because it's an anti-Congress movement. When the farm movement started, uh, 600 farmers died on the streets outside Delhi. I went and supported that movement. People say you're doing it because, uh, you know, it's against your government. I don't do what I do to make anybody else unhappy. In the 15 years almost that I've been in parliament, I've never made one single personal attack on any politician or party. I don't believe in it. And I, and I will never do it because I just think it's a glorious waste of time and it achieves nothing. But what I will do is, if there is a, yesterday, in Dehradun, yesterday, 100,000 students were on the streets in Dehradun protesting against the faulty process by which you get jobs, right? The recruitment process. And they were treated pretty roughly. So I'm here in Chennai and I'm saying that, that they shouldn't have been driven to that. Is violence acceptable? Of course it's not acceptable. But when people get desperate and when they feel that nobody's listening, they try and make their voice heard. The point is, in every tweet of mine, in every statement of mine, I try and be of use to people. I try and be part of something larger than myself. There are politicians who, if you read their interviews, all they say is, I was supposed to be chief minister, I didn't become chief minister. I was supposed to become, I was promised this portfolio, but I was insulted. In my entire career, have you ever heard me saying, I was hard done by? Somebody said, I, I want to say uh, something today which most people don't know. I've turned down a ministership twice. Really? Yes, and what I'm saying it? it in public. When? Who? That, that doesn't matter. Okay, but which, the point which, is no, no, that, no. Which is Modi or was it uh, Vajpayee? No, no, Vajpayee was barely born. How old I was? Vajpayee ke the god mein hum khele. Oh, sorry, yeah. But the point is that I will say one thing. You see, last year, I said something to my leadership. I said, sir, if I accept anything from you, the message that will go in the country is that this guy was only speaking to get something, now he's got something, now he's quiet. This message should not go in people. See, posts come and go. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is the goodwill that you have in people 
and how much you can fight for people who don't have the necessary ability to fight for themselves. I remember I, uh, we, I was sitting next to uh, respected Montek Singh Aluwalia ji on the flight and I told him an anecdote. Uh, I'm sorry sir to repeat it. I said, uh, you know when I was young, we used to live in a colony in Delhi called Maharani Bagh. And uh, my mother had this habit of taking in stray dogs and animals etc. People used to throw them out, we used to take them in. And I had a habit uh, of, uh, you know, feeding birds in the morning and evening. I used to feed birds, I don't, I don't know why, so, from a very young age. And one day I came home from school, I was about eight years old, and I was trying to pet a dog, a new dog, and the dog bit me. And then it chased me around the garden. So I shouted, and uh, I thought that, you know, some security person or some uh, uh, gardener may come and save me. But nobody came. All those birds came down from the tree and attacked the dog. And that was my first, that was the first time in my life that I realized if you obey the laws of the universe, those laws sometimes protect you in turn. So if you do good, your neighbor may not uh, appreciate it. The person in, in, uh, in your automatic immediate milieu may not appreciate it but somebody somewhere is racking up points for you. You see, the BJP, <laughs> that's why I was talking about, the BJP of Vajpayee and Advani was very different from the BJP of today, right? Sure. I mean, you had a poet, you had a, you know, a, a person with a renaissance kind of mindset. And today you have a more practical uh, BJP. My poetry book is coming out at the end of this year, <laughs> sir. <laughs> I should plug it, no, Prabhuji? Uh, plug sure. everything. So, no, you, are, you, are, you, you write poetry, you, you're a writer, you are, have, you're an intellectual. You're more like a great-grandfather than your cousin is. How does that fit into this new BJP? New BJP or new India? A new India, I'll, I haven't gone that yet, but… See, uh, I'll tell you something. Vajpayee was an extraordinary person in many ways. Prime Minister Modi is also an extraordinary person in many ways. You don't get to where you get to by being an average person. Whether you're Dr. Manmohan Singh, whether you're Vajpayee whether you're uh, Prime Minister Modi, these are all outstanding people in some shape or form. So rather than nitpicking and saying, you know, this is a little uh, sideways or this is a little acute or this is a little, uh, you know, disproportionate, I prefer as a younger person to learn from people elder than me. And I think everybody's got a lot to teach. One of the things I will say about um, Vajpayee ji, he was a very big hearted person and he was a very kind person. And uh, you know, he was like a grandfather, not just to young people like me, but he had that fatherly paternal sentiment towards the whole country. Prime Minister Modi has raised the game of Indian politics. You can't be lazy anymore. You can't be entitled anymore. You can't sit on your laurels and just say that, uh, you know, I have a famous name or I have this much uh, money or I belong to this caste, you know. Uh, so there are things to appreciate in everyone. And I think that's a more healthy way of looking at things. So and it's also safer. <laughs> <laughs> so when you turned down the ministerships, uh, were they offended? Look, if you say things to someone in a respectful manner and if you say things in a manner in which their respect is maintained and there is logic in your statements, people are big hearted. It's only when you put things in a disrespectful manner and it comes from a place of ego then people start feeling that, you know, this person… Uh okay, it's my last question before we throw it to the audience. I'm sure the young people like to talk to you. The, the topic is um, the way forward for education. What are the way forward for Varun Gandhi? Oh, that is a million dollar question. Look, I think that what I would like to do is 
always keep the last man of India in my sights. And I know it's very fashionable now to talk about the poorest of the poor, etc. But I will say this, as long as young people are struggling, as long as farmers are struggling, as long as small entrepreneurs are struggling, as long as there is still some miles to go in the pathway towards creating the India of our dreams, people like me will always keep pushing back. And that's the way forward. You know, uh, you, you've written this, the book on urban solutions. Yeah, put it, um, urbanization, India. yeah. You know, India has always been identified by its villages. Yeah. We all talk about rural India and the farmer and the villages and the idol and pastoral. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But India's also had great cities. Humongous, if you look from Mohanjadara onwards, yeah. we had great cities. But nobody talks about the city as as important a, a, a geographical entity you as… You know, I in this book have not simply looked at cities as economic engines which is one very important aspect of them. I've also looked at them in a manner that we need to humanize them, make them more inclusive. We need to look at the urban migrant experience, right? We need to look at ecological factors. Why is it that, you know, in, I read an article today saying somebody's bought an apartment in Bombay for 250 crores. You know, the way Bombay, uh, Mumbai is going, I don't know if it'll be there 100 years later, the way uh, El Nino is, the way all these climate change factors are. So we really need to look at uh, decongesting our cities. We need to look at urban financing. We need to look at ecological factors. Look what happened in Joshimat. It's not a small thing. Look what's happened in Turkey and Syria. Right? Of course, those are vastly different factors. One are man-made and one is... Uh, nature made, but the point is that, uh, I mean, I, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but today if you go to any hill station in India, you know, it's almost like a slum. And uh, it's, uh, these are the most beautiful crowning jewels of I India. So my feeling is very simple. How can we make cities more livable? Uh, you know, there is uh, many ways to look at the future. But we don't need to look at cities versus villages. Mm. If cities do better, villages inadvertently will do better. If villages collapse economically, cities will have an influx of poor migrants and they will crumble. So both need to do better and that's the way forward. Last question, are you planning any Bharat Choro Yatra or you people? You don't believe in Padhyatras? I say Bharat to Juda hai. So you mean that Bharat… But I don't want to talk too much in Hindi, lest somebody heckle no, no, me. No, I'm yeah. sure that everyone is a national hmm? language. So My Tamil it? is not so good. <laughs> All right, so I'm throwing open the, uh, the, the no, session to questions. Uh, I can see a lot of black. hungry sharks out there. Uh, the, the lady in black there? Yeah, please. You, I'll, I'll just come to you, yeah. Please. Uh, hello, sir. Thank Hi. you so much for the insightful session. Thank you, ma'am. Actually, I wanted to ask uh, about lateral entry of corporate and academic minds into the government to make policy. And following up with that, I sincerely think that uh, the government should use market research and design thinking techniques when they are crafting policy because they are very humanistic centered. You get uh, um, quantitative significant data which you can use to create your policies. I think policies right now are being created uh, on the basis of less data. So, uh, can I hear your thoughts on that? I mean, I think what you said is absolutely brilliant, it's correct. We need the best minds on this. And uh, the fact is, like when I, uh, not this book for urbanization, there's a lot of data available, but when I wrote uh, a rural manifesto, uh, one of the things, I mean, I, I, let me just digress a little bit. I took one constituency where I was the MP for that time, Sultanpur. I'm now the MP of Pilibhit. And uh, I wanted to know why is everyone fighting with everybody in the villages, right? What is the empirical evidence of this? What's the data? And I didn't know how to approach the problem. 
So I just did one thing. I found out intra-village. I took 10 villages. Intra-village, what were the amount of court cases filed from people against each other in one village? And in 1952, it was four. And today, it was 62. So I just wanted to know, why is the social fabric breaking down? Is it because optimal population is no longer there? It's been breached so badly. Is it because of, you know, less resources? But I completely agree with you. The more we know, which is what data really is, the more we'll know what we don't know, right? And the more we know, the more we'll know how to deal with any given problem. And I completely agree with your view of lateral entry, of policy experts, of the best minds in India. I, I completely agree with that. In fact, one of the good things about this government uh, is that, uh, and this is a growing trend, government to government, is a lot of people from non-political backgrounds have been given ministerial responsibilities based on their ability, which is, I think, a forward-looking trend. Thank you. Yeah, please. Sir, I'm Manoj Prabhagaran. Hi. College student. Sir, uh, my question is, uh, Parliament is meeting at least three times to, during a year. Uh, in each session, barely 60 days. Yeah. But even in that 60 days, we are not able to achieve 100 percentage of attendance, <coughs> member of parliament. So 100 percent of? Attendance of the attendance. member of parliament. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> because… Uh, well, I missed parliament to be here today. So kindly don't give me a red mark in your book. <laughs> yeah. So it's not about you. <coughs> <coughs> because uh, if a college student fails to get at least 60 percentage of attendance, yeah. he is not able to allow… <laughs> If he fails to get attendance, he is not able to write semester exams. Yeah. But for the parliamentarians, if they are failed to, uh, if they are regularly absent, no such provision. Uh, my question is how to reduce absenteeism for the parliamentarians and make parliament more functional? Look, I will take a, I'll take a little less popular view here. It's not about attendance. It's about what you bring to the table when you're there. If you uh, go to parliament and you sit there every day and you mark your thing and you earn your daily wage, that's not really helping the country. The idea is to push through legislation which is of use to people. So I don't think attendance is the hallmark of a great parliamentarian. Uh, who are the great parliamentarians? You have. Uh, you know, people like Hiren Mukherjee, people like Atal Bihari Vajpayee, Indrajit Gupta, Somna Chatterjee, I don't know why I'm only naming leftists for some reason. Uh, Firoz Gandhi, my grandfather was a great parliamentarian. Pilu Modi, you had people like Dr. Karan Singh, you had great parliamentarian in India. Uh, I don't know whether they came to parliament more or they came to parliament less, but I tell you what, they amplified your voice, which is the voice that needs to be amplified. And they pushed for legislation that makes more avenues available to you and more self-respect for people like you. And so that, I think, is more important than just showing up. One of the things in parliament is, should we have a whip system for every single thing? Should we... In America, you have individual voting records. They're very important because when you judge your member of parliament, you say, was he pro-industry? Was he pro-farmer? You know, was he pro-LGBT? Whatever, right? But in India, we don't have individual voting records because I vote my party's line. So which, you know, I can agree with or disagree with, but if I go against the line, I'm expelled. So I think this is a parliamentary reform that should take place. We got two, time for two more questions. Yeah, the gentleman on the, gentleman. On the left. Yeah. Sir, the biggest thing that you mentioned about the, the changes that you want to make in the Indian education system, why is not implemented yet? That is a question that I can't answer, my friend. I mean, how, how can I answer that? 
Okay. Next. Oh, sir, my question If is I that. was part of the committee that implemented these uh, changes, then I would certainly tell you. But uh, until I get there, I'm afraid I'll have to give my suggestions just like you. Okay, last question. Gentleman Black, here. Yeah. yeah. Man in Black. So, uh, good evening, sir. Hi. So, you talked about uh, how you've given up the uh, monthly salary and how you've urged other ministers to do the same. Members of parliament, not yeah. ministers, yeah. So, uh, my question is, as a politician, how do you measure your productivity? It's a very good question. And so I just answered it right now. Yeah, when I spoke to the other person. Look, productivity is about two things. In my constituency, my productivity is the amount of solutions I can offer people in their daily problems. So being a member of parliament on the policy end is different from being the member of parliament on the executive end. So when a poor person calls me as they did when I was in my room just now, and one person said to me that I'm standing outside All India Medical Institute in Delhi, and I've been here for one day, but nobody's giving me an appointment. So I called my office, I said, please go to All India Medical Institute right now, get this person an appointment, see to it that his tests are done immediately. So that's a small way of measuring productivity. The bigger way is, uh, what do you add value to in terms of policy? Do you have anything original to say? Are you, are you adding value to the existing body of knowledge? That's one way to measure it. So these are two different ways. All right, now time's up. Thank you, Mr. Gandhi.